first video, you heard a bit about my story that I became an addict. But the big question was, why did I become an addict? Because, like I said, me and my friends all party together, and we all use the same stuff in the same amounts at the same time. But only I turned into an addict, and this made no sense to me. And I wanted to find out why I was different from my friends. So I studied what modern science had to say about addiction. Science says that our brains have evolved to encourage and reward us when we do things that help us survive. Eating, exercising, or reproducing, for example. For many thousands of years, this system has served us well. But as technology has advanced, we figured out ways to synthetically trick our brains to experience pleasure when we're not even doing any of those things, by inventing drugs. Thanks to drugs, we can now create pleasure responses in our brains recreationally. Instead of getting those natural ones that only happen when we do something positive that helps our long-term survival. And the artificial pleasure responses can be made so intense that often in some of us, the craving to regain those feelings takes on a life of its own, leading to more and more craving. All these advancements in modern medicine came with a dark side. Addiction all of which takes place in the brain. The chemistry of addiction takes place mostly in the brain's pleasure system, a group of structures inside the brain that are activated whenever we experience something pleasurable, like using an addictive drug. Some scientists refer to this as the go system, as in, I like that a lot, let's go for it and let's get some more. Still, I was puzzled. Why doesn't everyone who takes drugs get addicted from this wild synthetic and unnatural chemical stimulation of the pleasure system in the brain? The answer to that question led me to risk factors. Science says that there are clear risk factors which may indicate a higher probability for certain people to develop the disease of addiction. And the more risk factors you have, the greater chances that you could turn into an addict. There are two major kind of risk factors genetic, and environmental. Empirical evidence seems to indicate that about 50% of people who develop an addiction get it from bad genes, and the other 50% get it due to bad environmental factors. As far as bad genes go, it has now been proven in numerous studies that some people have a genetic predisposition to addiction, including studies of twins and siblings of alcoholic parents who were raised in completely separate environments. I must confess, the bad gene argument did resonate with me. Others in my family have had the disease of addiction, but we didn't have any terrible environmental risk factors growing up. So it must have been due to something else. With bad genes, you come pre-wired towards addiction from birth. Can you think of any possible addicts in your environment? Someone who always drinks, drugs, smokes, or gambles too much over and over and just can't seem to stop? If this resonates with you, consider the possibility that you may have some of these bad genes waiting around inside of you. To be clear, this doesn't mean that even if you have bad genes that you will turn into an addict. It just means that you have a higher probability of doing so than the rest of the general population. Unfortunately, even if your genes are good, you are still potentially at risk for developing an addiction due to adverse environmental factors. One theory is that bad environmental factors leading to unhappiness with reality may entice people to enjoy and value the artificial highs that drugs produce more so than sober life. The drugs temporarily free them to escape from their current problems in their environment, which are making them miserable, which they simply cannot alter or control. Things like stress, mental disorders, unstable family relationships, difficulty with peers in school, uncomfortable transitions, if you have some combination of the above factors pressing on you, and you prefer getting high rather than to deal with them, they may have led you into the last and most dangerous category of risk factors, which is the most relevant to teenagers. Early use. Research shows that the earlier in life a person begins to use drugs, the more likely they are to progress to more serious abuse and addiction. This was a key insight for me in trying to understand why I developed the addiction problem. Here's why. Until fairly recently, scientists thought that the brain finished the nuts and bolts of its development by the time we started kindergarten. But as it turns out, while our brains are already about 95% 
full size by the time we were about six, the brain doesn't finish growing connections between its different parts until we are well into our 20s. This means that during the teen years, you go through several years of internal and invisible neural growing pains in conjunction with the other more visible puberty-driven growth that's going on all over the outside of your body. The brain during the teen years is like a big ball of unhardened clay and it grows and shapes itself in response to external stimulus, just like your external muscles do when challenged by weightlifting or sports. As the brain keeps developing, those neural pathways that transmit signals to each other that you are actively using as an adolescent eventually become more and more reinforced, insulated, and padded. This padding greatly increases the cell's transmission speed and helps the brain make faster decisions. It's like building a superhighway where thoughts traveling along it can go at very high speed. These brain highways are still being formed in teens and they form to support the things you do most frequently at the time. At the same time, as all this brain building is just starting to peak, this is also when the brain starts getting thinned out. You actually start losing connections that you don't use which has led to a theory that the teen years are a kind of use it or lose it time of life, meaning adolescence could be an especially important time to use your brain, play an instrument, read books, engage in sports, write poetry, learn a language, because by doing these things, you are helping to hardwire and bake in those thought superhighways, which gives your brain a lovely lasting shape. Whereas if you're sitting around all day drinking or doing drugs, those will be the connections that survive. This process of brain building slows dramatically when we reach approximately 25, and the connections you've built up until then become the main shape of your brain for the rest of your life, which is why the early use of mind-altering substances is such a crucial risk factor in turning potential addiction into real addiction for some of us. So how does this brain wiring take place? Step in. The brain has over 80 billion neurons. When we have any kind of thought, your brain creates unique electrical patterns along these neuron pathways, which go off like a camera flash. These neurological flashes and the patterns they create become the thoughts themselves. So when we learn anything, or when we have any thoughts, these flashes grow, in the sense that they connect to more neurons. And the connections between these neurons become stronger and stronger, bigger and faster. And just as a large water pipe will take more water, and a wire that's larger will take more electricity, the brain works the same way. The more you think and do something repetitively, the more the wires grow to help that particular thought or action. And the faster the thoughts around that action can flow through your brain network. If we look at how addiction builds up over the years, it starts off with normal thoughts. For example, I just wanna look cool, so I'll smoke or have a drink, or I'll take a drug. I wanna fit in, I wanna party. I don't wanna think about that now. Sometimes this turns into, I just want some peace, or I'm bored. Sometimes it's, I just really want to get wasted, and I'll show them. The thoughts just build up and build up. They all end up with the same outcome, which is the use of a drug or a drink, or both. Quite often, the thoughts evolve from wanting to fit in and wanting to have a good time to thoughts of how bad I'm feeling. And then I need to have a drink or a drug just to feel normal. The thoughts repeat and build up over time, and it creates specific patterns of thinking in our brains, all of which lead to the same outcome of using a drug or having a drink. The more this happens, the easier the electricity goes down the wires, and the more habitual it becomes to the point where it may seem impossible not to use or have that drink. So what I took away from all this brain science as to why I became an addict and others didn't is I probably had a higher level of risk factors present in my personal environment than many of my peers. When I use drugs, my higher than normal risk factors led me to having a completely different response and experience inside my head than others were having. Even though all were using the same stuff at the same time as we partied together. And I had absolutely no way to know this at the time. Because my brain was not fully wired up yet, my brain's pleasure center began to rewire and grow towards facilitating the artificial stimulus as it found it irresistibly attractive, like a bug at night that's attracted to a light bulb. I didn't know it then, but each time I used, since my brain was still wiring up, I continued to develop, reinforce, and strengthen the wiring that eventually led to my full-on addiction problem. As my brain matured, and as its neural pathways hardened, 
it encapsulated my now faulty wiring into my normal thinking patterns, like wet concrete hardening, leading me to further maladaptive behaviors. I lost other potentially good wiring as my brain was also pruning the unused wiring at the same time it was encapsulating all the bad stuff. All the time I spent getting high and escaping from reality could have otherwise been spent on other, more productive, and more stimulating activities that could have encouraged and ultimately locked in good growth neurons and a more healthy brain landscape. By studying brain science, I finally understood why I became an addict, and a lot of other kids didn't. But then I actually wondered if I had known about these risk factors back then, if somebody had given me a list of them, would that have helped me to not become an addict? Everybody's got some kind of stress or other dysfunction and most of us have visible addicts somewhere in our family food chains. So I don't think so. I don't think just knowing the risk factors would have helped me at all in the end. What I now believe would have helped me instead was if I had paid attention to the addiction signs I was throwing off. You see, I now realize there were in fact signs, obvious signs, even way back then, that I was susceptible to addiction. But unfortunately, I was completely oblivious to them at the time, and nobody told me about them or what to look for. I thought about this for a long time. Looking back, I can see all those signs very clearly now. I made a list of those signs. They are signs you need to know.